Okay, so uh, thank you for coming back. Uh, my name is Yolanta Teresavich and I'm from LRT. And uh, I hope you had a nice lunch and uh, a bit of time to rest. Uh, and um, now we can start our second session. Uh, the year 2019 is uh, elections year for most of European countries, but for Lithuania especially, because we, ha uh, we just had, uh, in March, uh, uh, we had uh, municipal elections, and uh, we are uh, in uh, May we will have uh, presidential elections and also European Parliament elections and uh, two referendums. So it is a very important topic for us, and uh, we decided um, to make a, a panel discussion uh, about this, and uh, we have invited uh, four guests uh, from uh, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and Great Britain uh, to to talk about uh, their experience because they also just had uh, uh, elections and um, uh, have uh, have uh, interesting things uh, uh, to tell us. Uh, so. Um, I will introduce uh, all the panelists. This is uh, uh, Sanita Jemberga uh, from uh, Latvia, executive director and editor at the Baltic Center for Investigative Journalism, Rea Baltica. Uh, then uh, uh, Thomas uh, Japonis from Strategic Communication Department uh, of Lithuanian Armed Forces. Uh, Olga Robinson from the BBC Monitoring. And when we hear BBC, we already know uh, what it means to us, the quality. <laughs> so, and uh, Holger Rönema uh, from uh, uh, Estonia, uh, also investigative journalist and uh, editor. So, uh, first I would ask uh, uh, Thomas Japonis to, to start about the biggest threats for our media okay. and all society. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. It's really a great pleasure to be here. F thank you very much for organizers uh, inviting uh, me here. And a uh, very short uh, presentation from my side, just a couple of minutes, what kind of threat we see for the in information environment here in Lithuania in the 21st uh, century. Um, I already was introduced. Uh, last eight years, I'm uh, serving in the Lithuanian Armed Forces Strategic Communication Department. Originally, we were created uh, when uh, we noticed uh, that classical uh, propaganda um, activities, uh, disinformation campaign, information operation, um, hostile in informational influence uh, already are present in our country. So there is no time to wait uh, until other indicators uh, of threat for our country will appear. We have to do something uh, now in order to protect our informational environment. And yes, we are living in very specific times, in very specific uh, location, and uh, if we look at such a book as uh, Simon and Huntington, we are the last uh, castle near the, um, let's say, line of civilization. On another side of border, we have a completely different uh, uh, system, different culture, different uh, values, uh, different uh, religion, different understanding uh, how we should operate in, in our media environment. And uh, we are trying to understand uh, what is happening, what is the intention of this country. And uh, probably it's not a big secret nowadays, but uh, Russian Federation, they already to regain, uh, they are trying to regain power um, globally and uh, regionally. And in order to achieve it, uh, they met a couple of challenges. Uh, first of all, um, many countries, uh, as Lithuania and others, uh, we don't want to be influenced. We don't want to be uh, somehow ruled through a different dimension. We would like to have our independent uh, uh, politic. Uh, we would like to run our country. And also NATO and European Union, it's a big uh, strategic um, organization and uh, definitely on the economical level it's very difficult for the um, 
Russia compete with European Union. Altogether, we are stronger, bigger, more resources. Uh, so that's why we think we are using all these informational influence tools in order to separate this organization, make it smaller, weaker, and later on deal with different countries separately. The same applies for the NATO. Altogether, we are bigger, we have uh, more resources, we have more um, manpower, more technologies. But again, that's why it's very good to use uh, this information and similar tools in order to make us uh, weaker. Uh, we check different uh, documents from very strategic level up to the tactical level and what we can say that in all these documents we can find some uh, points about informational influence, info war, propaganda, disinformation and similar tools. So we can uh, very clearly state that uh, Russia is already on the path of info war. It's a really now question. Do we in Western countries understand this and are we ready for response for these activities or not yet? Uh, and uh, probably the shortest way to explain how Russia changed their activities in the last uh, couple of uh, decades, uh, we still remember uh, First Chechnya War, later on Second Chechnya War, later on war with uh, Georgia, and now we are still seeing uh, war in, in Ukraine. But if we compare all this military campaign, we can see definitely some specific changes. And uh, the main changes uh, uh, we can see in our informational environment. And uh, as is stated here in this slide, uh, probably the shortest way to explain what is war, when one country uses violence in order to make other countries uh, uh, do what the first country wants. But uh, what we can achieve in 21st century, that this phase of violence, this phase of uh, kinetic activities might be skipped and later on changed by informational influence. So by doing informational influence, you can achieve the same results, which before you could achieve only by using uh, kinetic power and traditional uh, military uh, force. And in order to understand overall influence in our countries, we have to check uh, not only traditional media, as uh, TV, radio, newspapers. Nowadays, in order to understand Russian activities, definitely we have to check full spectrum of different channels through which we have for ability um, influence our society. And this is only on the informational dimension. Uh, I believe uh, also we have to check uh, other dimensions as economical, finances, and so on. Uh, so many different tools and uh, software, uh, social media, uh, different conferences, and many, many other activities which we have to track in order to understand what is their main aims. And even um, in our case, uh, nowadays it's really not enough to just track their activities inside our countries. Yes, it's a main uh, object of our investigation, uh, what is happening in our internal Lithuanian uh, in information area, but also we are part of NATO, we are part of European Union. It's, so it's very important that uh, we would have possibility to talk about ourselves, uh, what we're doing, where we are going, what is our real history, also with uh, our partners from our countries. And yes, we also have um, eager to speak uh, directly with the citizens of Russian Federation, of Belarus, but we can talk for hours that in what we can see in the last decades that uh, these um, audiences, they became more and more close. So uh, our messages from Western boards are uh, very difficult to reach uh, these audiences in Russia and Belarus. And here we see challenges for us. Uh, uh, Lithuania, we have no very visible tools through which we can communicate with our partners, with our NATO and European uh, countries. But Russia do. Sputnik, RT, uh, Russia 24, many other uh, tools could be used in order to talk about us instead of us. In the same way, we're getting information about our neighbors uh, through these channels, which I presented a couple slides ago. Uh, targets. In order to understand their activities, definitely we're trying to understand uh, wha what are main targets uh, for their activities. And here, um, these targets are not in priority list. And, uh, Simply what we would like to show that there are so many different uh, directions and definitely we as a military and other state institution, we can understand um, how this uh, disinformation and propaganda campaign is happening. Uh, but in order to do something against it, uh, it's really not enough to react from the governmental level. It's very important to react from different uh, levels of society, journalism, business and so on. But I will continue uh, later on in my presentation. Yes, election. I'm very happy that finally after investigation about possibility to influence the United States uh, election. Uh, finally, even in our countries, we started to 
also interested in this uh, topic, uh, but um, probably Lithuanian historian, historians, uh, they would say that uh, different processes of political activities in our country, they are influenced already for the centuries. Uh, simply, we were not uh, talking about it uh, very openly. Just a couple of examples, uh, 1940s, again, we had very good military forces, but there was no political will to use these forces. There was created some kind of atmosphere that uh, Red Army is our friends, but not, not our enemies. And later on, definitely elections, the most democratic election, as is said here in this poster from 1940s, uh, but uh, only one political party were allowed, communistic party, and also it's really not possible to organize a democratic election when you have presence of foreign uh, military forces in the country. And later on, definitely in Crimea, we saw something very, sim very similar. Yep. Uh, so we have a complex approach, uh, so many different tools are used, many different uh, players are playing in this game, so in order to understand everything, definitely we can uh, prepare some complex uh, approach. And probably the first step is uh, try to understand what is happening in, in our informational environment. So we are tr starting our job for by catching some specific messages, later on we are trying to uh, connect these messages into teams, and later on teams are connected into narratives and we are trying to understand their, um, let's say, campaign inside our country. And also we're trying to understand tools uh, and other, let's say, strengthening things, um, how we're doing their activities. And later on we are preparing definitely reports uh, and uh, we are very happy that these reports are already circling in the NATO level and European Union level, but it's again really not enough. Uh, it's very important to spread this information for our society. We believe then our society, they will understand uh, about these activities. Uh, it will be kind of uh, like inoculation against uh, disinformation and propaganda. Uh, just a couple of examples, uh, just a few. Um, how it looks in Lithuania. So from last year, NATO and Lithuanian military exercises, uh, we had real accidents when several uh, military vehicles, uh, they collapsed into each other. Uh, military column was protected by military police, so civilians were not involved in this accident. But uh, despite this, uh, immediately were created a fake news story that uh, these uh, military vehicles, they hit a 12 years old boy, and definitely this boy was uh, killed. What was a completely fake uh, news story. And later on, we tried to um, spread this information inside our informational environment. And another example uh, from international and international environment, uh, the story started in the Italy, so Italian languages, and not so many guys are following uh, this um, news on, in this language. Uh, main story was that uh, probably you have followed this uh, story what happened in uh, Maidan and uh, you know that uh, there was a day when uh, somewhere around 100 uh, um, guys who participated in Maidan were shot by unknown snipers. So the main idea of this fake news story was that the snipers were from Georgia and from Lithuania. So again, it's a very emotional message, I believe, especially for Ukrainians. And we have very good relationship between uh, Georgia, Lithuania and Ukraine. So these kind of messages, we are targeting our um, unity. I'm happy that later on this, in, uh, this case was deconstructed in all these three countries, but despite the fact, if you check the, this uh, story in the uh, Russian, different um, so-called news uh, sources, uh, this, uh, you know, let's say, story is still as a, presented as a real story. Uh, different activities from a different level. and. Um, I s uh, still believe that part of this game are playing uh, government, and uh, one of the strongest tools of the government definitely is uh, uh, law. And a different, very important part of our life in our country is regulated by a law. If we talk about finances, if we talk about business, energy, and so on and so on. But somehow, because we are a democratic country, because we regain freedom, we think that informational environment, or we thought that informational environment it should supposed to be completely free, and everybody could do whatever they want. 
And in a good world, probably it would be a case. But unfortunately, we have also bad players in this game. And all these uh, new spaces, which m might be very quickly filled by information, unfortunately, is uh, better used against us, against our societies, uh, by some authoritarian regime, by global uh, terrorist uh, network, than we are allowed. So we already had some cases, and probably Euro uh, Lithuania was the first European Union country which uh, um, used laws in order to punish some Russian TV channels because of open uh, propaganda. All the time it was decision by the court. And social media, it's uh, again a very useful tool. I really like uh, social media, but also it's a uh, big headache uh, because um, it's very difficult to understand uh, from where information appears. And this information appears very quickly. And different resources, again, they uh, appear very quickly. And if we have uh, laws which are uh, let's say, regulates uh, what we can do with traditional media. Uh, we all the time have to work and adapt the laws of uh, what we uh, can achieve and how we can use laws uh, for the social media. So it's again a future challenge uh, for us. And uh, some data from different uh, sources. Uh, here is information from uh, polling conducted by European Union. Uh, general idea is that the pretty big uh, society of European Union, they encounter fake news on a daily basis. And also uh, more than somewhere around 70-80% uh, of responders, they said that uh, fake news is a challenge for their countries and also a challenge for the uh, democracy in their countries at all. And uh, after, again, after investigation in the United States of, uh, for the possibility to influence election, finally when we, we see the owners of the major uh, social media platforms, they at least are invited in the discussion and they finally get an impression that this is uh, good tools, but also these good tools are used in order to do some specific not so good activities in our democratic uh, countries. And, uh, Fresh example from this year, we already had several cases when uh, Facebook closed some uh, specific social media profiles just because of their connection with uh, Sputnik. And uh, as you see here, they are pretended as uh, some platforms uh, writing about weather, about fashion, about sport, but from time to time they are passing some specific uh, messages in order to uh, influence um, communities around well, about them. And the responses from a different level. And one of the stories from Lithuania about uh, internet elves, and uh, probably you read the stories about uh, Kreml troll factories, and according to their books and movies, who are the best guys to fight against trolls? So it's uh, elves, and a pretty big community here in Lithuania, and uh, I think it's a part of a success story, that you are reacting not only from the government level, because in this case, for their propaganda, it's very easy uh, to say that this is only your government doing this action. But when it's a response from the government, from the society, from the media, from the business, uh, it's really much more difficult for them to do their uh, disinformation campaign. And here is our like a philosophical understanding of what uh, we can do and actually who from our Western society is supposed to be involved in all this activity. So we can start from very tactical level. We count that every single citizen have the role play into, in this game. Uh, first of all, uh, all the time be interested what is happening in, in our country. Uh, real no facts, real no data, no, real history of our country. And in this case, definitely it's much more uh, difficult for Russia to manipulate with different uh, facts. Uh, later on media, I believe that the information environment is uh, the main business area for the media. So I think uh, it should be also a challenge for them how to make uh, information area as clean as possible uh, from fake news, disinformation, propaganda and similar stuff. Later on business, media channels, uh, social media platforms, uh, and many other tools were in private hands. So without involvement of uh, business, it's difficult. it will be very difficult for us to achieve some specific uh, results. I already talk about activities from the state, from laws up to other activities, and also NATO and European Union. If they think that, uh, or if we think that uh, we have an uh, information environment, so we have to somehow protect uh, and at least understand what is happening in our informational environment. So actually, that's it. And I hope uh, later on we will have a discussion further. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, <clears throat> yes, maybe we 
can uh, proceed with the questions afterwards, after all presentations, because are all in, they are all in common, you know. And uh, now uh, let me ask uh, Senator Yemberga to take the floor, okay? Um, yes, please. Labas dienas, Braliukas. You are Prime Minister alleges we are not, but we actually think we are. And uh, my name is Sanita Jemberga. Uh, I'm not Inga Springe, who is the founder of Robotica and who was supposed to be here. Um, and she asked me to replace her. And I did just because we want to support a Lithuanian public broadcaster. After all what Lithuanian public broadcaster has been through with Monica last year, uh, we think that it is important. Uh, they've been good to us, the public broadcasting, to us as a country, it's and Robotica, so that's why I agreed to come and talk about the thing which I profoundly hate, uh, which is Facebook. So um, I will get back to public broadcast after I show you what we did to protect Latvian elections and to see who is attacking it, because there is a situation in Latvia as well. But let me argue with the gentleman here. And by the way, do you know how you know as a good journalist? She doesn't know how to use a PowerPoint. And I am a prime example of that. So if anyone can help me with getting it on, that would be brilliant. Thank you. So uh, I would argue with the gentleman that um, it's easy for military and politicians to say Russia is the main threat. And... Um, and we have to protect our elections from Russia. Uh, me, as a journalist, would have to say, what proof do we have that Russia is a threat? Who else is a threat? And what exactly has been done? And I would argue that Facebook is as big threat to electoral integrity as any hostile country is, because Facebook simply is too big to understand what's going on, especially if we are talking about small languages. And obviously, we've always thought that we are the center of the world, and so does Lithuanians and Estonians. But we are small, and Facebook is really bad in checking what's going on in small languages. So before elections, my wonderful colleague Inga and I spent a considerable time thinking, what can be done to see what's going on in social networks. How can we systematically see uh, the influences? How can we systematically see the sources of those influences? And also, if the law is being broken, because the Latvian law is pretty strict about openness and spending on campaign. So what did we do? Uh, Rebaltica, which I represent, is the best known kind of investigative cooperative in the Baltics. We come from the media background. Uh, we left when, uh, when the oligarchs took over the, the best Latvian newspaper. And we created models that we have something we want to do, we find the money, and then we find the partners. We believe in finding partners because alone you will do a zillion times less than you will do with the partners. And we are very open about what we do. So we went to, uh, we, we got together national media, regional media, and said, listen, we are going to do this election monitoring on Facebook, and uh, we are going to produce weekly newsletters, we're going to produce raw data, we're going to produce the stories. Who is in? And uh, they came in because they helped as a distributor so you can reach actually the people in regions and elsewhere. So we called it a pop-up newsroom because people contributed their own correspondence, we contributed ours. And we contributed researchers who did, did this on daily basis. We stopped at two tools. One was CrowdTangle, and you can see the, the threatening figures, how much you actually have to look at for a small Latvian elections. And then um, Ad Collector, which was a tool developed by ProPublica, which is the nonprofit in the United States. We chose it because we care about data protection and about people's data, and they seem to be less invasive of the ones we could find because we were asking people to install this, uh, this thing on their browsers so we, we could see 
who was seeing which adverts, because Facebook micro-targets adverts at you. So people's data were coming in uh, to our newsroom to see who is advertising, whom they are targeting, who is paying for this. So what we focused on was we thought that we have to expose sources of this information, uh, not kind of just an individual groups or something, but is there any network or something? Uh, obviously, we looked as if there is a proof of Russia's interference, and if there is, then how? Uh, then we looked at micro-targeting, who tells what and to whom, because that helped to understand the party strategies. And also we looked into adverts, because that helps to understand the party spending. So uh, this is a pretty obvious, uh, and I'm sorry for my spelling mistakes, because this is another way how you distinguish a professional speaker from journalist who hates PowerPoint. I have mistakes on mine. So um, what was our conclusion was 70% of Latvian population uses Facebook and uh, also social media on a daily basis. They were big. In campaigns, they were big because they are comparably cheap and cheerful. Um, if you have to buy advertising on television, it costs. Facebook is still very cheap. Um, about one-tenth of all Latvian campaign spending officially went into Facebook. That's what is declared. And the Latvian politicians had come to realize that this is something they can work with and they understand, some of them, how to do it. So, uh, is it effective? Absolutely, yes. Because here is one example. This is new and upcoming party, which is left from a center. And uh, let me explain to you one thing Latvians don't do left. Uh, we are, you know, all liberals, everyone on their own, center, center, right, left is something communist uh, or pro-Russian, and we don't get it. This party came and said, we are socially left. They're small, they're young, they have no money. So about 33,500 in campaign budget, half went into social media. And they micro-targeted people they were interested in, and they got 2.6 votes, which doesn't get them into parliament, because for that you need 5%. But over 2% gets you a state funding so they can develop into a proper political structure if they have um, the power. In the old times, they wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, in the Facebook times, they were. And another example, which I think my Holger from Estonia will uh, recognize um, these days, um, is a party called KPV, um, which is our only proper populist party. Um, they were almost non-existent before elections, they had one very, very visible member in parliament, but that was it. And then one thing happened, he was arrested uh, on allegations of illegal party funding, and they started to use Facebook to mobilize their electorate. And they were very, very effective. They were non-stop uh, Facebook lives, in which truth didn't matter at all. But for their audience, what mattered was anger and anti-establishment. And media are against us. Everyone is against us. State is stolen. We are going to fix it with a really simple recipes which are not possible. Uh, and uh, it proved where this comes from, where they were popular. Because after elections, Baltic Media Center of Excellence did a survey about who got information where, who got from television, who got from social media, who got from, from the papers. And these were the groups which were really, really um, listening to them. And they were all on Facebook. And that's how they targeted also a huge Latvian vote outside Latvia, which is the United Kingdom. Second place in elections, almost 15% of vote, not bad. Um, what was our conclusions? We didn't have a paid political post by anonymous accounts or non-traceable accounts. But, uh, and they were clearly affiliated with the party, so you could see it. But we had a number of groups, and this is the thing which I think is going to repeat it, uh, itself. They're built up before elections. You don't see their administrators 
they are not even related to politics. One of the most popular was Where to Eat. Another one was a group which was built after Maxima's tragedy when the roof collapsed, where people unified in that group. It was taken over before elections by the Populist Party. And uh, we don't see who are the owners, we don't see who pays them. And they had a huge membership. So it can be Russia, it can be China, it can be you know, your local populist party, you will never, never know it. Uh, and here is a good example, since we were asked to talk about what Lithuanians could, could learn from us. Election protection from external interference is something which is in the interests of all groups of society. And we are obviously not on a very good terms with political power uh, as media because we have a different tasks. But before elections, our state chancery, which is kind of our, it's not prime minister's office, it's kind of the head of civil service, uh, together with the Baltic Media Center of Excellence, created informal group. They invited all editors who were willing to be part of it. They were inviting all the police force, regular security, um, everything else, who else was there? I think prosecutors were there as well. And they, we met I think three times in total. Uh, the meetings were open to all the media editors. They explained what they thought the threats were, in their opinion, what they are seeing in a real time. Uh, they gave us all the hotlines, etc., where to call. We expressed what we need on election day and how can it be done. For example, if you see that something goes massively wrong, that there is, you know, in social media some posts spreading about the vote buying massively somewhere and it's fake. Whom, whom do we can, uh, can, uh, can contact in that case? And uh, they were the only ones with whom Facebook and Google talked properly. Because we, as media, are too small. Uh, Facebook came before Latvian elections to Latvian Delphi, which is the biggest online media, to run a campaign how great they are in trying to protect elections, but that was just about it. Uh, there was two public relations people for 22 countries. I mean, <laughs> how, how does that work? Uh, Google didn't even react on, you know, being reported about that this is, this is fake, this is, you know, illegal, etc. Facebook tried, but only for their own PR purposes. But with the state, they talked. And why did they talk with the state? Because they fear regulation. Uh, they don't fear the local public opinion, but regulation they do fear. So what we concluded, we concluded that uh, to protect elections, we can find a method how to see uh, what's going on, but we need a legislative change. One thing was, if we regulate everything else in campaign, why don't we regulate social media and ask them to abide by the rules? Uh, public Facebook uh, pages administrators, advertising, you know, and information kept for at least a year. Well, Facebook now, Last week, they had this press conference about what they are going to do to protect elections, and they said they are going to keep it for seven years now. And they will make, you know, the public is a, who bought the political advertising, and you can buy it it's your own country only, but it doesn't solve the problem with anonymous groups at all. Uh, we will have to regulate an EU level, and um, also, um, as the Television has a regulator. Brits are going into a direction of, of social media regulator. And we think that's probably where we are going to end up because they are too big and uh, the rules for them doesn't exist really uh, enforceable. And what was good after all this? We were able to come out and say we didn't see an interference from Russia. Uh, via social networks in an organized manner. We're not talking about individual trolls or something, that's kind of understandable, but we see these problems. And some discussion went on, so we did our journalistic duty, uh, not to scare people, but to show what was going on. And with that, I am concluding, and I'll be ready to answer any questions, but I will come back after everyone else has done, if we have a time to talk about the situation with the Latvian public broadcaster. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. And now, Holger, please. Uh, That's not right. That's not right.
Uh, that's what happens when you prepare the presentation in Keynote and it gets formatted into PowerPoint. Um, hi everyone, I'm Holger Rohn. I'm, a, I'm an investigative journalist working with the investigative team of Postimers newspaper in Estonia. Uh, we are a brother company to Lithuanian uh, 15 Min, so if uh, anyone from 15 Min is here, then hi. Um, I wanted to talk to you today about two of the investigations that we did in Postimes ahead of uh, parliamentary elections uh, early March this year. Uh, both of these investigations actually did relate very much to, to Facebook, as uh, Sanita was uh, just uh, telling you in, in, uh, in Latvia's case as well. But, uh, but some of the background is, is a bit different. It works. <laughs> this is a meme uh, that was published uh, early in December last year in, in one Facebook group. Uh, the girl who is blindfolded, uh, the word on her says truth. And the logos on the shooting squad are the one of Estonian uh, public broadcaster, RR, Delphi, Postimus. And the yellow one with a squirrel for some reason is a logo of the Liberal Reform Party. Uh, and the caption, of course, says that the media is lying. I will let you take that vote, and then I will go on to the next. <laughs> uh, the meme was posted on uh, the Stoners Facebook uh, group. The, the group had been uh, established only in the beginning of October last year. And under the title Stoners, it promises to, to share creative news. What is a creative uh, news? I'm, I'm not quite sure. But among other people uh, resembled here on the cover photo, you can see the pre president of Estonia, Kersti Kailulaid, and the prime minister of uh, Estonia. Is that working as well? Ah, Yuri Ratas. Um, the Estonia's Facebook group, uh, yeah, as I said, it was created early in October, but it was growing really fast, and it got going especially fast uh, in late November and December when the debate, I don't think it was a debate, but when the issue of Estonia joining or not joining the, Europe, the United Nations Migration Pact uh, came up, there were protests on the street and the government was almost collapsing. Uh, that's when uh, the, the Estonia's Facebook group also became really lively. They started sharing a lot of memes. Most of the memes uh, were about liberal Estonian politicians, such as the president. Um, they were strongly uh, supporting or pushing the anti-mass immigration uh, topic, uh, about anti-EU, anti-press. Uh, and anti-NATO, of course. Uh, the Russian uh, description of a page, uh, to translate it very roughly, very, very easily, uh, said that uh, the group is a community for people uh, who can talk about issues happening in the society, no matter the language. And uh, its aim is to help people understand uh, where we are going hand in hand with our government. Um, I noticed, I picked up that uh, Facebook group uh, in December uh, when the UN Migration Pact was, uh, was on uh, public agenda. And these are some of the other memes that uh, they were actually posting and, and sharing. Uh, what we were doing is uh, they were pushing the hashtag EU, and the title here means that leaving the European Union equals uh, survival. Um, and together with a the meme, they posted a link to a petition site uh, where they were gathering, or someone was gathering uh, people's signatures to, to support uh, the idea of Estonia actually exiting uh, the European Union. And the other one on the right is another one about uh, freedom of speech and independence uh, a la European Union. And if you can see uh, on the colors of a gentleman, uh, EL in Estonian language, it, it means uh, European Union. So this is just to give you an idea what, uh, what this group was pushing. But so we started looking at uh, who, is, uh, who was behind the group. The group had 10 or 11 moderators and uh, administrators. Uh, we identified that they all uh, had joined Facebook uh, early September in the time frame of three days all these people who, by their profile photos and by their actions, they seem to be in their 20s and 30s. So that is the first red flag, that if you see someone who is 30 join, join uh, Facebook only now, 
when probably that person shouldn't exist or something must be, must be wrong with him or her. Uh, <laughs> but you haven't joined Facebook as well. <laughs> and there is something wrong with you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, they used mostly very generic photos uh, to identify themselves. Um, and they had created some, something like a CV for them. Uh, they had posted photos saying something like, good to be back in work, uh, nice weather in, the, in this lovely autumn looking forward for a vacation, just to leave an idea that they would be, that they are okay, normal people. Um, mostly they used very regular Estonian uh, names, uh, that we, we have like tens of hundreds of people occurring in, in Estonia, such as Kallas, Lepik, and Ilves. And uh, they said in Facebook that they had actually attended uh, Estonian high schools and, and universities. But uh, they spoke a lot in Estonian language. Uh, they had Estonian names, not Russian names, but we could see uh, structural mistakes uh, in the way they, they wrote in Estonian language. It is not, these were not the mistakes that uh, poorly educated Estonian people would make. These were mistakes that someone who is not a native speaker would make. Um, we checked everything. Uh, we called uh, the schools that we said they had at attended. Uh, one of them actually said that he had graduated the same high school as I did uh, in a small town of Rakvara. Uh, we called to the schools. We went back to the lists of uh, students from 1950s. <laughs> and they said that uh, such people had, uh, had never gone to their schools. So who were they? Uh, we don't know. Uh, I can't say that we were Russian or that this campaign was initiated from Russia because we, were not we did not manage to, to conclude or prove anything like that. But uh, I am quite confident that uh, these were Russian people who, were actually, who had actually created the fake profiles uh, and then the fake profiles created the, the Estonia's Facebook group uh, and then started spreading this disinformation and polarizing uh, the, the society. And all in all, we, we discovered something uh, like 20 or 30 fake accounts uh, doing this. Um, and as Sanita said that Facebook is too large, we don't care about our countries. We didn't have any expectations after we, we ran the first story. We thought that now we need to start fighting with Facebook to actually get their attention to it and to, to kill these uh, profiles. But actually, we were wrong. Uh, ten days later, uh, first of all, we, these administrators and, and moderators were suspended. Um, and then uh, another one or two weeks later, all of them had been uh, deleted and also the entire Estonia's group was deleted. I was very surprised to actually see something like that, like that happen. And I think that is part of the reason why we actually don't know who to attribute this, this campaign to. But we didn't actually see what was their final aim. Uh, I think, or we think, that it was connected to the elections. Uh, and I tend to think that the true goal was more European Parliament elections than the Parliament, uh, Estonian national uh, Parliament uh, elections. Because most of the topics uh, and the hashtags and everything that we were pushing uh, actually were pointing to, to European topics. Um, so that's, uh, that, that was one investigation which actually led us uh, to another one. Uh, formatting is wrong again, sorry. Uh, this is a campaign that we know who to attribute it to and it was not Russia. It, ac it actually originated uh, from the Estonian far-right party, uh, Ekrem, who is very popular and who will now be a new member of Estonian government. Uh, the coalition agreement has been signed and they will get uh, four or five uh, ministerial posts and, and one of the representatives is, um, is going to be already actually is the chairman of, uh, of Estonian parliament. Um, but uh, their youth organization, which carries the name the Blue Awakening, uh, for me it feels a bit like a terrorist organization's name, but, but let it be. Uh, they had come up with a plan, uh, which I'm uh, happy that, that we, we discovered. Uh, they had created something like 60 uh, fake profiles on Facebook, completely fake profiles, uh, such as this one, Jaak Kivi, a very regular name in Estonia again, but this person doesn't exist. Uh, Jaak Kivi is a pseudonym of Ruben Kaleb, who is 
the most Nazi member of the ECRE party and a very prominent member in, the, in their youth organization. Um, he posted comments uh, and uh, he shared aggressive memes. He trolled on uh, other politicians' websites. Uh, not, sorry, not websites, but Facebook profiles. Um, and he had been doing, doing it uh, for, for, uh, for several months already. And he was just one of the, one of the tens of, of profiles that we identified. Uh, among others, uh, we discovered the family, of, uh, the family named Walter. There was uh, Bert Walter uh, and Kert Walter. And allegedly, we had a sister whose name was Kerto Walter. <laughs> they were all fake identities. They didn't exist. Which make this, makes the story a bit embarrassing is that Bert and Kert, who claimed to be university students at uh, Tartu University, they actually managed to get opinion stories under these names published in uh, Delphi and uh, one of the national uh, newspapers, Esti Päivalet in Estonia. Uh, when we started looking into the background, we made one call to the university to, to ask about uh, these offers. If they are actually students, uh, they came back to, to us and said that no, these people don't exist. And of course, there were no references to, to people uh, with these names in, in Google or in any of the national databases, in business registry, in property registry, in anywhere. Um, when we uncovered this uh, kind of network uh, in the beginning, the ECRA Youth Organization, they rejected the idea that they were behind it. But they were so vain that uh, the day we published the first story, uh, Ruben Kaleb, uh, the main guy, sent out the press release and said that, yes, I am behind uh, some of these accounts and I am happy to be. Uh, he had hidden messages into these opinion pieces that when you read the first letters of some sentences, you can see that Delphi is stupid, uh, is, comes from the first letters, or that my name is actually Ruben Kaleb. So he, he had like encrypted uh, messages into, into, the, into the texts. Uh, the party chairman, Mart Helme, uh, his initial reaction was that this story is yet another information campaign by Postimes against the party, and that nothing like that has happened. Um, after that, Ruben Kaleb came out and said that uh, actually it, it was me and then some of my comrades who, who was behind it. Then they changed their, their tactics, tactics and said that uh, it is our right to use pseudonyms. It is the same as uh, we are writers. It's a literary work that, that we are doing. No, it is not literary work. You are trying to influence people's opinions ahead of uh, elections. And the third thing that they said is that anyway, it is only a beginning. At the head of elections, we will come out with much more complex information operations. So that is the kind of uh, environment that, uh, that we were living in. And luckily, again, uh, Facebook reacted quite okay. Uh, they blocked or deleted most of the accounts, but the ones, uh, some of the most critical ones, for example, this uh, same Jaak Kivi, is still open, and they are still trolling on, uh, on Facebook. Um, what I want to say in conclusion is that um, I think that such investigations are the job of media. We have some voluntary organizations such as Propostop or such as the Lithuanian Elves who are contributing as well. But, uh, uh, and we used a bit the, the help of a student Propostop. But uh, without the media, no matter if it's posthumous pro public broadcasters or, or whoever, such things won't come out in advance. They can maybe come out um, uh, in hindsight. And in both these cases, we are actually very lucky to have been uh, able to, to, to come out or to, to publish the, the stories uh, relatively long time ahead of the elections that they didn't actually manage to, to get so much uh, traction. Um, and an important point to remember is that the state is only helpful uh, when it comes to foreign meddling. When we published the story about the Estonian group, the Estonian uh, St Stratcom team uh, working in the state chancellery, uh, they reported uh, all of this to Facebook through very direct contacts. Uh, also, we did report it, and also the readers reported it uh, through Facebook. But I think that it was the state chancellery reacting that actually made Facebook move so quick. But when uh, we actually came out uh, with the ECRA youth, uh, youth farm, troll farm uh, story. Uh, the state chancellor stepped back and said that uh, they don't feel comfortable dealing with it. 
uh, even though the contents are basically the same, the methods, the strategy is basically the same, and the, the goal of the operation is basically the same. But because it can be considered um, uh, from the state chancellery as, uh, as uh, being uh, getting engaged in local politics uh, ahead of uh, the elections, they prefer to, to stay away. And probably that's also one of the main reasons why Facebook's uh, reaction was so much uh, softer to, to that case. Thank you. Thank you very much, Holger. And uh, now our last uh, presenter, Olga Robinson, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be here today to talk about the role of quality journalism in tackling fake news and disinformation, as well as what the BBC is doing as a major public broadcaster to address the issue. But before we begin, let me say a few words about BBC Monitoring, the department that I come from. BBC Monitoring is a specialist unit within BBC News that tracks thousands of international media sources, including hard to reach ones, and reports news from and about the world's media and social media. Set up at the outbreak of World War II with the primary purpose of reporting and observing propaganda in Nazi-controlled media, BBC Monitoring has a very long history of tackling disinformation. Today, the unit still relies on its detailed knowledge of media environment and sources around the globe, as well as linguistic, regional and cultural expertise to navigate the increasingly complex information space. And as media experts, what is it that we are seeing in terms of disinformation trends? Well, first of all, disinformation is a truly global problem, as no country appears to be immune to manipulation and misleading claims. From Egypt to India and from Iran to Mexico, an increasing number of players are using new media platforms and telecommunications technologies to sow discord and manipulate public opinion. More traditional censorship of course still exists, for example, in China, in North Korea, as, as well as, as do um, easily identifiable campaigns or relatively easily identifiable campaigns that promote biased hashtags and create an illusion of public consensus on a certain sensitive issue. But there are also signs that some disinformation methods are becoming more sophisticated both in terms of techniques that they rely on and technology. Just to give you a quick example, if four years ago, an experienced Russia watcher would probably be able to identify a bot within literally just a few minutes, the same procedure today might take you much, much longer. Some of the disinformation efforts also target specific demographic groups, as well as they tailor their messages to specific audiences, for example, the next generation of voters. Some of them also rely on loose network of actors that might be, that might range from state officials, media, state controlled media, influencers on Twitter and Facebook, as well as trolls and their automated version bots. And these networks, very loose ones, uh, very often push competing narratives and uh, try to not convince people that something is true or not, but confuse them and paralyze their will. And we, we have seen examples of that happening over the past few years uh, with Russian operations, for example, um, and the latest, one of the latest examples is the reaction to the Salisbury attack last year in the UK. So given the diversity and the spread of disinformation techniques, we at BBC Monitoring consider it essential to use a complex approach to disinformation. In our daily monitoring of international media, we regularly analyze and verify social media content, including images and video, 
We report news about disinformation, as well as the public debate, research, and legislation on the topic. Last year, BBC Monitoring also launched a new dedicated disinformation team, and I'm proud to be part of that team. And our primary purpose is to spot, collate, and investigate examples of manipulation, both in traditional and social media, as well as outline and raise awareness of disinformation techniques that we are seeing. Of course, what we are doing at BBC Monitoring is in line with the wider BBC efforts to tackle fake news and disinformation. Let me talk you through some of those. Reality Check is uh, a team that investigates claims and counterclaims, helping their audiences get straight to the facts and cut through the information noise. Whether it's Brexit or election campaigns across the globe or misleading claims made by officials in various countries, reality check journalists will be there to provide relevant and immediate analysis. BBC Trending is another team that reports in depth on the world of social media, explaining the stories, the real stories behind, behind some of the viral social media trends. They investigate popular social media content, sort the truth from fabricated stories, and challenge viral myths and assumptions. Their stories can range from the use of trolls and bots in the run-up to a presidential election in countries like Mexico, for example, as you can see in the example, um, and rumors about alleged child kidnappers that are spreading like wildfire on WhatsApp, or even allegations that there is an online um, suicide game in Russia that <coughs> literally kills um, children. Africa Eye, is the BBC's new investigative unit that aims to promote the culture of investigative journalism in Africa. In September 2018, they uncovered the truth behind a viral video showing the killing of women in Cameroon through forensic analysis of open source data that was carried out in collaboration with open source investigators. And if you haven't seen that it yet, Please do, it is really worth a watch. In addition, Africa Eye journalists, and you can see um, on, the, on the left hand slide, described in detail, transparently, on Twitter, in a very long Twitter feed, uh, tw Twitter thread, how they achieved the results and how they found the actual culprits um, behind the killing. And thus, they promoted an awareness of what to look out for when coming across such stories. In addition to such forensic reporting and open source analysis, the BBC is helping to promote media literacy in the UK and across the globe through initiatives such as the Young Reporter Scheme. Working in partnership with uh, schools, colleges, and charities. The project provides young uh, people aged 11 to 18. Uh, the, um, it gives them the opportunity to acquire skills they need to create and understand the media. And that, of course, includes uh, identifying disinformation. Last year, the BBC, in the same period, also launched iReporter, an interactive game that helps young people spot fake news. And it's exceptionally entertaining. I actually found it really interesting myself. It puts you, the game puts you in the shoes of um, a young reporter who's just joined the BBC and shows you how to verify stories and make an informed decision whether to report something or not. Also in 2018, the BBC launched a huge international anti-disinformation initiative called Beyond Fake News. The project kicked off in November with original research into how disinformation spreads and what makes us share disinformation and fake news stories. 
as well as a series of documentaries, special reports and features investigating the challenges posed by fake news, including technology and, for example, deep fakes. The Beyond Fake News season, similar to the Young Reporter Scheme, also included a media literacy program that delivered workshops in India and Kenya. As I said at the beginning of the presentation, in a rapidly changing digital world, disinformation is a truly global challenge, and I cannot emphasize it more. It challenges democracies and affects societies whether inf where information is in short supply. In order to successfully operate in such a toxic and complex environment, it is essential not to only fact check individual claims and verify online content, although that is important, of course, as well. It is also essential to provide context, raise awareness about disinformation techniques and trends and tactics, provide fact-based, verifiable analysis that people can rely on, and promote media literacy. In other words, it is essential to provide quality journalism that is accurate, balanced, and independent in order to help your audiences navigate the increasingly muddled information space and help them restore their trust in pro proven facts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Olga. And, um, uh, so we already have all four presentations and uh, from the silence in the hall, I felt that uh, uh, it was interesting for everyone, not only for me. Uh, so maybe uh, somebody now has a question to ask our panelists. Yes, please. Um, hello, uh, my name is Gina Donovskaita, I'm from Lithuanian Journalism Center. I want to ask Sanita, uh, you were um, telling ab us about um, how Facebook and Google do not really care about uh, public opinion and they would more care about uh, regulators. And I wanted to ask you, do the regulators, uh, what is your own ex uh, experience have actually uh, an opinion on, of, on how to regulate Facebook and Google? local regulators, I mean, not on EU level, but in Latvia, for example. Hi. Uh, no, I don't think they have, because uh, they're simply not a regulator for social media content. We have a regulator for TV and audiovisuals, uh, but it's a new and undeveloping field, and I think we'll be just learning, you know, from other countries, like looking at what Britain is doing, because this pretty much ahead uh, talking with other EU partners, because it's, it's a very fastly changing field. I wouldn't blame them for that. And since I have a microphone, uh, I intend to abuse my position with the microphone and talk about the Latvian public broadcaster, because the, the session is going to be up. And uh, before we came on this panel, me and Holger uh, joked that um, I said to him that he shouldn't uh, forget to invite me to the public lashing uh, of um, him and other Estonian journalists when it's going to take place in Tallinn. And it wasn't a joke because ECRE has been, this party has been suggesting that the journalist who ask a critical question to a public broadcaster should be somehow punished. And it sounds like a joke, but these jokes tend to turn into reality way too quickly here. And I saw Agnes from Hungary in the, in the room and uh, I've worked as OSCE analyst in Hungarian elections and we measured the content of the broadcasts. And so-called public broadcaster had 90% of positive news about the government and that's called public broadcaster. So the jokes turn into really kind of bad reality. And uh, in Latvian case, and in Lithuanian and Estonian, public broadcasters have been under some sort of attack for most of their existence. And I still have to find a politician who thinks that the public broadcaster is fair to them or that they show too many good news and too little bad news, etc. But we shouldn't lose 
the bigger view why we need the public broadcasters in the Baltics. Because we have no other hope for media plurality, for plurality of opinions, there will be no one else because privates buy and sell the Baltic media every few years and there's a business principle. If we don't have a strong public broadcasters, then we will have no hope. And that's why we, as a whole society, should be interested and caring about how they are. And of course, it doesn't prevent the proper oversight and questioning, are they working in public interest? But there has to be a bigger picture why we need them. And here comes the good bit of good news <laughs> from the most unlikely bearer of good news. Um, Latvian media regulator dismissed a head of public broadcaster and a second board member on December 28. The brilliant news time, uh, Christmas, long holidays, uh, quite murky explanations, difficult to understand right or wrong, and opened, and I mean, it, it went quietly, surprisingly quietly, and regulator opened an open competition for these posts, which last week ended with a person being chosen for a head of public broadcaster who had not a proper experience in a business management or media, who had a very questionable business experience and no understanding of uh, what the public broadcaster is for, what we could judge from his interviews publicly. And a very unlikely thing happened. Uh, one of the heads, uh, one of the anchors, moderators of TV program took a time after the interview program and expressed his views in live television about this person being utterly inappropriate to lead the public broadcaster and listed the reasons why. So um, next day, understandably, debate was on. But um, the whole journalistic community this time, both the Journalism Association, the public radio, the private commercial TV channel stood behind them and said this was the right thing to do. This was in the public interest because it is a task of a journalist to explain why the public broadcaster can't have a head like this. So at the end, um, the person who was chosen uh, and the deputy, not the deputy, the second uh, board member said that they don't feel they can take up these posts in the current conditions. Latvian Journalists Association has gone to prosecutors and they have opened a probe about legality of this competition. And I think the next thing is uh, we will have to talk about the media regulator and their ability to do their work. Because at the end of the day, they may be believed they're doing the right thing, but the result was damaging to public broadcaster. And living in such a space as we are now, living next to not a very friendly country, and by that I don't mean Estonia or Lithuania. Uh, we, living in such a small media market, we can't afford to weaken those public broadcasters. And my, my genuine belief is we will not get anything more in terms of free speech as we have now. So we have to defend everything we have there and not to go one step back because that's what we chose in the 90s. And that's where we have to stay. And with that, I, this sounds very pathetic probably, but... Um, that shows that people actually are ready to go and defend the public broadcast. And I wish you Lithuanians exactly the same thing. And I wish you Holger is not, you know, lashed in the public square in Tallinn for asking critical questions. But then we will probably uh, defend you too. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, I know uh, Holger also uh, has to tell a bit about uh, Estonian public broadcaster. <laughs> Uh, yes, Sanita made we, we a very good introduction already, but the public broadcaster in Estonia has historically had a very high ranking rating of credibility, uh, public credibility. Uh, but now what has happened with a new far-right party uh, coming out strong in the elections and first time 
in history being uh, included in uh, in the coalition. Um, and in the context where we see the politicians uh, from that party, but also from, uh, from other parties, uh, saying one thing today, saying the other thing tomorrow, not giving direct answers uh, to questions uh, relating uh, to their statements over the last four years uh, regarding uh, immigration, regarding minority rights uh, whatsoever. They are just ignoring the questions. And uh, that's what journalists must do then. They must go and ask again. And if needed, they must uh, use a different tactic and become uh, a bit more aggressive in, in, in their approach. So that's exactly the kind of situation that, that happened in Estonia. Uh, a normal journalistic process, so to say. But that didn't prevent uh, one of the leading figures of the ECRA parties to file an official complaint uh, so that action would be taken against uh, journalists who, uh, who are too aggressive and who show allegedly who show, who show bias in their approach to, to interviewees. And actually, yesterday evening, the regulatory body of the public broadcasters uh, convened, and that was uh, the most uh, heatedly discussed topic in the room. They discussed about it uh, for two or three hours, uh, which is uh, a Kafkaesque thing for me, because for me, the freedom of press and then the rights of uh, journalists, uh, no matter if in uh, public media or, or in uh, commercial media, it, it seems like taken, I, I take them for granted. But now that I would presume that we, the people in that body, regulatory body, also would take it for granted. But to come out and say after that, after, after the, the meeting, that we had a very heated debate about it, uh, which, that totally brings us to, to, a, to a new normality or a new level that they were actually debated about whether to, uh, what to do with it and whether to actually punish the, the journalists. So that's, that's not an uh, okay sit situation. And at the same time, I don't, feel, I don't think actually that, uh, that uh, ECRE or any of the other politicians would directly want the journalists to be uh, fired or punished. But what they are doing, uh, they are, their tactic is to get the credibility of a public broadcasters down, as, as we have done uh, with the commercial media over the last four years. But now they found a new opponent and to also tear down the, the, the credibility of the public broadcasters. And I think that if they continue on pushing such messages, which they are doing, uh, I think they might succeed. I'm, I'm worried about that. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Just a short comment on the on the last topic. Uh, I'm from Estonian public broadcasting, and uh, I had the um, <coughs> chance to to be at the meeting uh, Olga was describing yesterday evening. So the discussion didn't last, fortunately, uh, for many hours on this topic. There were other topics as well. And uh, I must say that uh, all the rest members of the, our council were strongly opposing <coughs> this one member's um, <coughs> well claims, which ended up uh, in a heated, um, very um, uh, saying by by uh, by Mr. Helmer that uh, well his his idea would be that. Uh, his suggestions for um, the journalists would be to commit uh, um, suicide uh, altogether. So it was really <coughs> unacceptable um, <coughs> way of uh, expressing. But fortunately, it's just one one member of our council. So <coughs> the rest of the the council are well <coughs> people with uh, with clear minds. Thank you very much for your comment. Okay, so as our time is up, and uh, you know, uh, I would like to ask you for more coffee and uh, stretch up your legs, because uh, after a short break we will continue discussing about the uh, public service media, its importance, all threats, and so on. So uh, I'm looking forward to see you back in half an hour. Thank you very much.